Well, folks, the release date of my first full video game, Moose Lucians, is upon us. What a ride it has been. I've learned more about programming, game design, and art than I could have hoped, and I truly view this as a new beginning. Regardless of how the game does, I'm going to take these new skills and put them into the next game. In my last video, I went over all of the computer science, game design, and art concepts you would have learned if you had made my game the way I made it. I did that as a way of comparing my experience with the experience of getting a degree in computer science at a major university. I went to school for computer science, but I don't actually have a computer science degree. That is to say, I didn't major in it. I minored in it while attending the University of Colorado at Boulder in the early 2000s. I actually majored in philosophy, which will surely draw a slew of comments from people in the audience. Yes, I'm that guy. <laughs> no, majoring in philosophy does not consign one to a life of poverty, and I'm an example of that. I look at it this way. Roughly 50% of your personality is genetically determined at birth. Another 50% comes from external factors, which are mostly made up of peer influences, but also contains the influence of your shared home environment. Some of those factors are basic things like nutrition, sleep, and exercise, which you can control to a certain degree. The philosophy major, just like the computer science major, draws in a certain kind of personality. My mom is a highly analytical business consultant, and my dad is a wildlife artist. I'm what you get when you mix those genes in North Dakota and Colorado in the 80s and 90s, for better or worse. So I always had this natural interest in philosophy, art, video games, and yes, even extreme sports. My dad raced snowmobiles in his youth. In any case, I'm only saying these things because I think they matter a great deal when talking about the decision to attend university or not. I don't believe universities shape rough clay into full-blown intellectuals capable of solving any problem. That's clearly false. Universities take from a certain stock of people, a mix of personalities, abilities, and interests, and they expose those people to a wide array of perspectives and topics. That's all they can hope to do. Just so, a university can no more produce an Einstein than I can make my German shepherd talk. Einsteins tend to want to go to universities because that's where all of the other interesting people hang out. Now that you understand how I view the purpose of education, I can compare and contrast my computer science education from the early 2000s to the same program offered at the same school right now. It is my hope that by watching this video, you will gain a more nuanced perspective of education. If you happen to be in the age group that is thinking about going to university, I hope it helps to better inform your decision. Much has changed since I went to school, in particular the price. It has only gotten more expensive. And although I appreciate much of what I was exposed to when I went to university, I can't help but wonder if kids today can get the same wide exposure to a variety of topics for a fraction of the cost. I spent a few years of my life just reading and discussing a ton of philosophy, the works of the early modern philosophers like Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz. I studied math, chemistry, physics, and statistics, all of which gave me a profound appreciation for the scientific method. It was just really cool that I got to do that, and it would be very wrong of me to say it didn't change me in some big ways. And now, another confession. I only minored in computer science because my mom told me it would be good for my career. She said I would make more money if I get a hard skill like computer programming. She was right, of course. That's not to say I didn't have a natural interest in computers. I was making websites as a teenager, but couldn't find much in the way of mentors. I tried making all of these visual basic programs in the 90s, just got super confused, and gave up. Had I been a teenager in 2014, I'm sure I would have eaten up Handmade Hero, Casey Miratori's YouTube show where he programs a complete game from scratch. I never had anything like that when I was a teen. When I compare computer science programs from my time in school to how I view them now, I want you to see the difference in perspective that I'm coming from. As an early 20-something, I wasn't nearly as critical of what I was being taught. Now I am a 40-year-old man who has made a buttload of software, someone who has experienced many of the highs and lows that the field has to offer. There's a Frank Herbert quote that sums up the intellectual sin I wish to avoid. Most believe that a satisfactory future 
requires a return to an idealized past, a past which never in fact existed. I'm a member of the handmade community, and to a certain degree, I think we can fall into this pattern of self-deception every now and then. There never was a time when all software was written in a low-level way and was therefore better. People were always struggling to make high-quality software in an affordable way, and they tried a bunch of things that failed. We can only hope to learn from what they tried, honestly ask ourselves what worked and what didn't, and move forward. With that said, here's what I remember from my computer science education back in the early 2000s. We took an introductory course where we learned the most basic programming skills using the C programming language. In that course, we learned about control flow, variables, functions, pointers, pointer arithmetic, and structures. We worked on some very simple programs that take an input, transform it in some way, and then print it to the console. I would call this class CS101. Everyone, both majors and minors, had to take it. Next up is the data structures class. We studied a variety of data structures and we dealt with many common problems that data structures make it easier to solve. For example, one week's topic might be stacks. We would learn what they are and then the homework project would have us writing a Java program that needs to use a stack to solve a problem that stacks are well equipped to solve. It was like this for the majority of the course, each week exploring a different data structure and homework to go along with it. And then there was the low-level programming class, Computers as Components. This class was often described as the, quote, weeder class, because many of the students switched majors after taking it. I'm probably quoting this number incorrectly, but I remember being told that only 20% of computer science students in the program would pass that class and move on to finish the rest of the major. Although it was the most difficult computer science class I took, I also thought it was the most interesting. We had labs every week where we would load assembly programs onto these old circuit boards, and we would build progressively more valuable software each week. We would start out with a simple assembly program that writes pixels to the LCD screen, and then we would end the course by making the functional equivalent of the software that runs on a portable MP3 player, like the iPod. We learned all the low-level goodness that would have applied back in the early 2000s. Registers, memory mapped I.O., the program stack, the stack pointer, instruction set architectures and how they differ, how to integrate raw assembly code with a higher level language like C. It was the coolest class I took. Although it was hard for me at the time, and I didn't do that well in it, I greatly appreciate being exposed to it. Next up is the human-computer interaction course. This is the course where you don't just learn how to program, you design a program with a user interface and you test whether people can intuitively understand how to use it. I remember this class being a bit of an odd duck. It's not exactly user interface design so much as it is learning the scientific method and applying it to user interface testing. So it's not like we spend a bunch of time learning user interface design tools or designing different user interfaces, or even UI design theory. We spent the time working in groups building an app prototype, and then going out there in the world and having random people use the app prototype while we record statistics on how far they got, whether they got value out of the app, or whether they did what we wanted them to do in the app. This class was an elective, but I like that it was a part of the program because it forces programmers to step outside of just writing code, put on the product development hat, and see what people actually do with the software they make. I say this tongue-in-cheek, but this class no longer prepares people for most actual software jobs. In most of the companies where I've worked, they try to put the programmers in a little corner and have them just write code. Usually, someone else has to care about what people actually do with the app, or whether it has any chance of being successful as a product. Sometimes you can be more effective in the jobs if you question what's in the Jira tickets, but it depends on who you're working with. I've definitely had people tell me to stop thinking so much when pushing back on tasks that make no sense. Others have appreciated that I care enough to not just do what I'm told. It's a mixed bag, an ever-shifting political reality you must learn to navigate as an adult. I've left many jobs because I didn't feel like I was being treated as the highly educated, multi-talented human being I am, that they were trying to turn me into some kind of mindless manufacturing drone who just does what he is told that I am being managed by people who only care about the number of tickets completed, not whether the things in the tickets will make the company successful. So this class is a great way to set you up with a somewhat idealistic expectation for what a software career will actually be. I love the intent behind it, and I personally support it, but oh how sad the state of most software jobs has become. 
Moving right along, I remember taking a numerical methods class. In a nutshell, the entire premise of this class was to make you well aware of the problems of representing numbers on computers. We worked on a few small assignments in MATLAB. We also had a big semester-long project we presented at the end. This class was designed for scientific computing. It covered the sort of computer science you would need to know if you were crunching the numbers for an experiment carried out at CERN or the LHC, for example. And finally, I remember having to take a linear algebra class. The math department offered this class, so it wasn't applied linear algebra. We dealt with matrices from a purely mathematical perspective, running various operations on them, understanding what happens to matrices when you transform them, and the properties of certain kinds of matrices. I enjoyed it because I enjoy math and philosophy, but I probably would have been better served if we could have spent more time drawing the connection between matrices in math and matrices in computer graphics where they are most useful. That's all I remember from that time. Because I only minored in it, computer science was just a small part of my college experience. So don't take what I'm saying as if I were a computer science major who took all of the classes they offered. As best as I can recall from then, I was exposed to object-oriented programming, but I don't remember having it forced on me. We wrote software with a variety of languages and tools. Object-oriented languages were one of them, but not the only one. So how does this compare to what the University of Colorado teaches now? I spent an afternoon looking at the classes on their website and comparing the descriptions to what I remember. Don't worry, I'm not going to say the department has been overrun with far-left nut jobs or we don't teach low-level programming anymore, and what a shame. I actually think the current program is pretty close to what I remember from nearly 20 years ago, but with a few changes. Let's look at the degree requirements. For a computer science major, you need to pass the following foundational courses. First, there's CSCI, 1000-1, Computer Science as a Field of Work and Study. I'm going to guess that this is a broad survey course that introduces the field of computer science at a very high level. Here's their description. Introduces curriculum, learning techniques, time management, and career opportunities in computer science. Includes presentations from alumni and others with relevant educational and professional experience. The website says this class is restricted to students with 0 to 26 credits, people who are basically freshmen. I would take it this course is designed to be an easy class for people to take their first year as they're getting used to being away from mom and dad. In that context, it sort of makes sense, but I certainly wouldn't want to take it as a junior or senior. It seems like there's a decent amount of fluff. Time management, for example, is the sort of thing you should put on individuals to deal with themselves. It doesn't need to be taught at the college level. If you are good at managing your time, you wouldn't attend a class on time management because you would have better things to do. Moving right along, we've got CSEI 1300-4, Computer Science 1, Starting Computing. This looks like the updated CS101 course I took nearly 20 years ago. Here's their description. Teaches techniques for writing computer programs in higher level programming languages to solve problems of interest in a range of application domains appropriate for students with little to no experience in computing or programming. It's basically an introduction to programming. It's hard for me to say much about this course without knowing exactly which high-level languages or techniques they're teaching. Technically, I would still consider C to be a high-level language, but others would contest that point and say C is a low-level language. I tend to meet people in the middle and say C is the lowest of the high-level languages. They might no longer teach C programming in this course. They might even teach a pile of object-oriented dogma. It's hard to say, but I can almost guarantee they won't get too complex with the material and will prefer to keep it simple, since this is an intro class. Now we are starting to get into the meat. We've got CSEI 2270-4, Computer Science 2, Data Structures. This is probably the same data structures class I took almost 20 years ago. Let's read the description. Studies data abstractions, for example, stacks, queues, lists, trees, graphs, heaps, hash tables, priority queues, and their representation techniques, for example, linking arrays. Introduces concepts used in algorithm design and analysis, including criteria for selecting data structures to fit their applications. Knowledge of C++ is highly recommended. Finally, some substance. Throughout the course of your career, you will use a wide variety of data structures. This is the one course you absolutely should not skip. 
It seems like they've changed who teaches this course. Back when I took it, I was a summer student and we used Java as the programming language. Now they use C++. I can't tell you if they're using the overly abstracted bullshit version of C++ or if they're doing C-flavored C++ where you have to implement all of the things as if starting from scratch, and that would be much more educational. Next, we've got CSCI 2400-4, Computer Systems. It's hard for me to say what this is going to be. It might be the replacement for the low-level programming class, Computers as Components. Here's their description. Covers how programs are represented and executed by modern computers, including low-level machine representation of programs and data, and understanding of how computer components and memory hierarchy influence performance. Awesome! They kept the low-level class. My faith in humanity is restored. <laughs> I can neither confirm nor deny if they made the class any easier or harder, or whether it is still the quote-unquote quote weeder class in the program. I remember this course being the most difficult one in the program, but also the most educational. Either way, I love that they still make you take this class. Everyone needs some exposure to low-level programming. To pair with data structures, we've got CSCI 3104-4, Algorithms. Yay, more substance. Although I don't remember taking an algorithms course that was separate from data structures back in the day, this is the right thing to teach. Here is their description. Covers the fundamentals of algorithms and various algorithmic strategies, including time and space complexity, sorting algorithms, recurrence relations, divide and conquer algorithms, greedy algorithms, dynamic programming, linear programming, graph algorithms, problems in P and NP, and approximation algorithms. I can't say much more. This is good stuff. It's absolutely necessary if you want to do deep, interesting, high-paying work that involves computers. I wish I had taken this course when I went to college. I had to gradually learn most of this while working various software jobs, and I use a great deal of these in my games. Next up, we've got CSCI 3155-4, Principles of Programming Languages. I don't remember taking a course like this, but from the title, I'm guessing it's the replacement for the compilers course they used to offer. Here's what they say. Studies principles governing the design and analysis of programming languages and their underlying execution models. Explores values, scoping, recursion, higher order functions, type systems, control structures, and objects. Introduces formal semantics as a framework for understanding programming features. Introduces advanced programming concepts such as functional programming, higher order functions, immutable values and structures, inductive types, functors, continuation passing, and object-oriented program using inheritance. Generics and covariance slash contravariance in a functional programming language such as Scala. Wow, that was, that was a mouthful there. Yep, this, this looks like the compiler's class. My take on this is similar to something Jonathan Blow might say. This looks like compilers with more of an academic slant to it, which is to say the kinds of compilers you're studying are more focused on expressing high-level math concepts. These compilers and languages are not exactly a tool for the everyday dirty work you usually find yourself doing in most commercial projects like video games. So while a course like this is foundational, one should be aware of the academic bias. People in academics deal with problems which are very different from the problems one would encounter in the business world. Different problems require different solutions and therefore different tools. A programming language is just a tool. What you include in the programming language should only be there if it addresses the problems you know you need to solve in the software you're making. And now we have the last foundation course in the computer science degree at CU Boulder, CSCI 3308-3. Software Development Methods and Tools. I'm probably going to disagree with most of this course, but if I were to guess, it's going to be a mixed bag with some useful things like how to use version control right next to some dubious things like Agile Scrum. Here is their description. Covers tools and techniques for successful software development with a strong focus on best practices used in industry. Students work in small teams to complete a semester-long application development project. Students learn front-end design and construction using HTML and CSS, back-end database design and construction, and full-stack integration. Students gain exposure to agile methodologies, web services, distributed version control, requirements definition, automated integration testing, and cloud-based application deployment.
This is basically the course they had to put into the curriculum due to pressures from the business world and parents. I don't remember it being a part of my education nearly 20 years ago. And yes, it's mostly what I predicted, a mixed bag of good stuff and bad stuff. Here is my core objection to the premise of this class. They assume they are teaching best practices, but I can't find any unbiased studies that prove a causal link between the practice of agile methodologies and positive outcomes for the businesses that employ them. Every empirical study I have found is sponsored by organizations that have a stake in the results being in favor of Agile. For example, Scrum.org ran its own study, but they profit from the sale of courses on Scrum. Another company, Broadcom Software, ran its own analysis, but they also aren't totally independent. They sell their clients on Agile and clearly have a stake in Agile being the correct methodology. So far as I can tell, no independent entity is looking at this with any degree of seriousness, which makes most claims about Agile dubious at best. It's not like Agile is some standard we all agree on, like how doctors have evidence-based medicine which legitimately improves patient outcomes in a measurable way. I say this as a recent heart surgery patient who very much appreciates evidence-based medicine. I would probably be dead in five years if we didn't have evidence-based medicine. There are many different flavors of Agile everywhere you go. People say they adhere to the one true Agile, but their actions often betray their words. If you want to know a company's true software development methodology, don't pay attention to what they say. Observe what their teams actually do. The worst companies will always say they adopt standard best practices. It doesn't mean they're making good software. The only way to know if they're making good software is to use the software. I don't believe software development methodologies like Agile belong in a university's core curriculum. Universities should be the one institution that stands for truth, critical thinking, and the scientific method. They shouldn't be a marketplace for charlatans. If they let in Agile and Scrum, they might as well open the door to the Dr. Oz and the MyPillow guy. I will hand it to them. This class does indeed prepare one for the work world in ways that no other class could. It gets you ready for the mountains of unsubstantiated bullshit you will encounter in most software jobs. Perhaps that is the intent. If it were up to me, I would replace it with a course called Evidence-Based Software Development Practices. It would be a critical thinking class where you have to design experiments to demonstrate that a particular practice, software development methodology, or use of a tool causes a measurably better outcome for the business that employs it. It would expose students to the scientific method, and it would help them develop a healthy skepticism for claims related to workplace productivity. At the end of the course, students would realize just how difficult it is to make any testable claims about human productivity in relation to software development. By contrast, students would be aware of how much easier it is to measure software performance and product market fit, which are valuable metrics. That wraps up the core classes. There's a long list of elective courses, and you need to complete at least five of them for the bachelor's degree. I'll just state them without going into too much detail since this video has already gone on long enough. Fundamentals of Human-Computer Interaction Introduction to Artificial Intelligence Design and Analysis of Database Systems Introduction to Robotics Introduction to Cybersecurity for a Converged World Theory of Computation Numerical Computation Design and Analysis of Operating Systems Advanced Data Science Network Systems Object-Oriented Analysis and Design Aside from the class on object-oriented programming, most of these look great. I like that the one class on OOP is an elective, and in this regard, the program hasn't changed much since back when I went. They also have the Senior Capstone Project, which can either be a software engineering project, entrepreneurial project, interdisciplinary capstone, or a senior thesis. I take it these options exist to give people an opportunity to pursue a wide range of interests. Some folks go into computer science wanting to do the next hot tech startup, while others have more academic inclinations. If I were taking the program, I would probably do the software engineering capstone since I am interested in building a business, but I also greatly enjoy building huge software projects from the ground up. That wraps up the video. Given all that I've discussed, here's my take on university in the year 2024. For one, it's nice to know it hasn't changed that much from what I remember. 
I love how they still make you take the very difficult low-level programming class, and there is enough meat in the core curriculum. I don't love the intrusion of snake oil salesmanship in the form of required coursework on agile methodologies, but it's only a small part of the degree. Interestingly, the act of doing the research for this video has helped me to pinpoint the source of a great deal of workplace-related resentment I felt for the past decade. I frequently resented that I was the most educated person in the room, but I had to answer to people who have much less education and experience than I do. I spent so much of my youth getting educated, taking tests, and jumping through hoops. From my perspective, I was the accomplished one, and my managers weren't. I passed the hard classes, and they didn't. I was set up to believe I would enter a career where I am respected, where I would deal with respectable people. When that expectation clashed with reality, it caused all kinds of negative emotions. If you spend decades passing all of these tests and building up this self-image as an A student, it can make you bitter and resentful when you are managed by C students. This is the double-edged sword of education. Be careful of the false expectations it might give you. Most people in the work world will not be the bright, thoughtful people you remember from your university years. There are a lot of zombies shuffling JIRA tickets and collecting a paycheck. There's a good chance your manager will be one of them. Just take a moment and think about the dynamics at play. What kind of competent software engineer wants to be a people manager? The best ones just want to build cool things, not sit in meetings all day. Computer science is a broad field that encompasses many kinds of work. It includes interesting new programming languages, academic theories that push the boundaries of knowledge, and video games. But it also includes the pointless Jira ticket jobs where you build the same shitty React Native app over and over again until your brain turns to mush. All of these things are called computer science, so be skeptical of the narrative you're being sold, both by universities and your potential employers. It's up to you to build the career that you want. Just because you have a computer science degree doesn't mean you deserve to have an interesting job. You might need to create that interesting job like I'm doing with the games I'm making. If I were trying to get a good, practical computer science education, I would take an intro to programming class, data structures, algorithms, and the computer systems class. The rest is mostly fluff, the kind of stuff you will eventually learn on your own once you enter the workforce. The best education is some combination of those four courses, along with a really big project like the puzzle game I made from scratch, Moose Lucians. That way you get both depth and breadth. Speaking of Moose Lucians, it launches today. Go and buy it on Steam. The link is at the top of the description. I'm never going to say you should or shouldn't get a college degree. That's your decision. If you think you are getting a good value for the price, you should do it. All I can do is go over the course material, offer my thoughts on it, and allow you to come to your own conclusions. When it comes to hiring, I hire people who can do what needs to be done, regardless of educational background. In the big scheme of things, college is a small part of life. It's only four years. So much more learning happens before and after college. It's easy to look back on college as a 40-year-old and say a bunch of it was bullshit. Of course I would have done things differently if you had put my mature 40-year-old brain into my 20-year-old body. And that's exactly my point. Once you mature out of needing college, you graduate. It's not so much that Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of college. It's more that they matured while they were in college, woke up one day, and noticed they had more important things to do than attend classes. If you can find a less expensive way to mature faster than they did, so much the better for you.